Hello friends. Welcome to the Eastern Front channel. Today we will talk with you about the memoirs of Friedrich Paulus adjutant, Wilhelm Adam. He fought with Paulus until he was captured in 1943. I was not making much progress in my efforts to keep a realistic picture of the fighting strength of our divisions and units. Therefore, I decided to visit some of the corps adjutants to speak to them about how we could more precisely establish the strengths of their many elements. I began with the nearby headquarters, the corps lay mainly in the city. It had, apart from the defeat of the 94th Infantry Division, suffered least from the beginning of the enemy offensive. The city had become the quietest fighting front of the cauldron. How is the atmosphere among the staff, I asked the adjutant. Not good, he replied, the older ones complain like mad. It is annoying that Paulus looks inactive while the 6th Army slowly but surely goes to earth. Seidlitz regards it as an irresponsible waffle by goring that 22 divisions could be supplied by air. He must know about Demyansk, would you like to read his memorandum, or do you know it already? I have heard about the memorandum at our headquarters, it interests me very much indeed. Have you the text there? But of course, Colonel, the adjutant went to his file chest, took a folder out and handed it to me. I read it ever more intently, precisely, matter-of-factly irrefutably, Seidlitz assessed our catastrophic supply situation, the continuing enemy offensive, the first effective relief measures taken by the Army High Command and the strength situation of the troops. All these hard facts demanded a decision. Either the 6th Army defends itself in a hedgehog position until it fades away, that means it is defenseless, or the Army breaks out of the encirclement in active engagement, concluded the General. He was not afraid of taking the requisite measures against Hitler's orders to hold out, and ended his memorandum with the words, if the army high command does not immediately lift the order to persevere in the hedgehog position, arising from their own knowledge about the army and the German people and the obligations of command, they themselves, despite the orders that until now have prevented freedom of maneuver, should make use of the still available possibility of avoiding catastrophe by means of their own attack. The complete destruction of 200,000 combatants and all of their equipment stands in the balance, there is no other option. That was civil courage, daring and decisiveness for independent handling as I then felt. That Seidlitz's goal was also none other than the army being saved for the continuation of the war, thus renew battles and dying did not occur to me. A moment later the thought came to me, what would happen if Seidlitz instead of Paulus was commander-in-chief of the 6th Army? I rated Paulus highly. In this case however, Seidlitz had my full respect. I asked the adjutant what would happen to the memorandum. It will go from the army via the army group to the army high command and, now you will laugh, Seidlitz is to take over the whole northern and eastern fronts of the cauldron. How did Paulus react to this clipping of his authority? That I cannot tell you, Colonel. I only know that a discussion took place between Paulus and Seidlitz. Once I had obtained the information about the personnel situation with the Corps, I drove back to my staff. I could not work out why Hitler had given Seidlitz command of the most important sectors of the cauldron. Did he want to tame the general, why should this be at Paulus's expense? Perhaps Elslep could answer these questions, I went to see him immediately after my arrival. He greeted me with the words, have you seen Seidlitz's memorandum, what do you have to say to that? I admire the precision and consequence of the judgment. I was naturally puzzled when I read the proposal to act against the Fuhrer order. We all, Paulus, Schmidt, I and the other commanding generals, disagree with this conclusion. That is absolute anarchy, I acknowledge that an army commander has the right and duty to make individual decisions, but only when he has no communications with the superior command. That is not the case with us, the high command is scrupulously informed about our situation. It is quite absurd to assume that the army high command will sacrifice us. Paulus told me yesterday that Hitler had been willing to order the army's breakout, under Göring's influence he then decided otherwise. Neither Paulus nor Schmidt nor you, not one of the commanding generals, none of US, believed in view of the whole war situation, that the Luftwaffe could keep an army of some 270,000 men supplied with food ammunition fuel, and medical supplies, that is utopia. It may have been possible before the envelopment, when the red ring around the 6th Army was not yet firm and the enemy anti-aircraft artillery was less effective. But now the enemy's flak and fighters are fully in action and it is completely out of the question. 
Of course, Adam, Paulus recognized this in the very first days of the encirclement. Major General Pickard, commanding the 9th Flak Division, regarded it as illusory that the Luftwaffe could keep our army sufficiently supplied. That is why the commander-in-chief let him fly to the army group on the November 27 to speak to Field Marshal von Manstein, without holding anything back, and to orientate him on the maximum possibilities of air supply with the Luftwaffe units available. Pickard was to openly explain and stress our doubts about the reality of air supply, and reiterate that the army could only be saved by breaking out with support from outside, therefore no time could be lost. A question, Elfslep, how many machines must fly into the cauldron every day if the army is to remain battle-worthy? You know, Adam, that we need at least 700 tons of supplies, and a Ju-52 takes 2 tons. So that means that every day 350 Ju-52s must land at Potomnik. A He-111 can only carry only one and a half tons. The number of machines thus rises to more than 400 should there not be enough Ju-52s available. Colonel Batter gave me a similar answer. And how many machines have actually flown in the last days? Only a small number, a quarter at the most. But let me go on. Pickard returns several days later. He reported to Paulus about his long talk with General Fiebig, the commanding general of the VIIF Air Corps, whom Hitler had tasked with the air supply of the 6th Army. Although this corps on Hitler's orders was spared from all combat tasks, Fiebig had to declare that he had too few machines to be able to fly the requested tonnage into the cauldron. He was himself in a conflict. He flew into the cauldron on the December 11th and declared before Paulus and Schmidt that he would do everything humanly possible to assist the badly suffering 6th Army. But he was not only lacking aircraft. Sometimes heavy frosts, raging snowstorms and thick fog paralyzed air traffic almost completely. As a result of this, on not a single day so far has he been able to deliver more than a quarter of the required tonnage. Within the next few days we will apparently be forced to further reduce the bread ration, which was already reduced to 200 grams a day at the end of November. This was only a small part of Arno von Lenski's memories. I am waiting for your discussions in the comments, also do not forget to like the video, subscribe to the channel see you all soon for now.